faithful to all of us. Praise God. Amen. You know that uh, we're living in, you're always talking about this new normal. I'm not buying it. I don't want the new normal. I want my normal. Right? So, you know, change is inevitable, except from a vending machine. Yeah. <laughs> you know, my three favorite things are eating my family and not using condoms. Having people beaten, 
had his people thrown in jail, had families being torn apart, and yet he gives this testimony. It's at the end of his, he feels like it's going to be coming to, towards the end of his life, and he says, I take you to record this day. In other words, write it down, mark it down, check the books, however you want to do it, that I am pure from the blood of all men. How? By the grace of God. Yes. Paul understood yes. grace, and he declared it over his own life. Yes. And you could say, but Paul, what about, yeah. you know, what about this one? What about Stephen? What about, you know, what about the road to Damascus? You were on your way to get letters so you could throw the church in jail and have them beaten and, and so on and so forth. No, I'm pure from the blood of all yes. men by the grace of God. Amen. That's where we all stand this morning. As believers, we are pure in the eyes of God. As if we have never committed a sin whatsoever. Yes. That's the truth. That's the Bible. Yes. Yeah. That doesn't mean we shouldn't want to try to reflect that in our lives. But we know that we are human and we will fail. But not in the eyes of God. Our testimony can always be the same. I am the righteousness Amen. of God in Christ. I don't care what you're seeing or thinking. I don't even care what I'm thinking sometimes because a lot of times I have more uh -huh. condemnation for myself than any of y'all could have. Because right. I know me better. Right. Praise the Lord. So let's look at this. For, in other words, Paul is saying, I've been forgiven in a way that this never happened. It's not just, okay, I forgive you for being a jerk. No, I forgive you because you didn't do anything. Exactly. Yeah. That's the way God has said it. You are forgiven. Because there is nothing to be forgiven of as far as I'm concerned. I have taught, dealt with it. I've already taken care of it. Yeah. I've dealt with every issue and circumstance that could confront you in your life in terms of sin. So let's go to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 7. Galatians 3 and verse 7. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Praise the Lord. So let me just start this way. God found an ordinary guy. Guy just like most of us. Abram. And God made some outrageous promises to him. I mean, unbelievable promises. Especially if you think about it. Abram was a polytheist. He wasn't a one God person when God came to him. He was living in Ur of the Chaldees and they were pagans. They believed in multiple gods. Gods for everything. Yes. They had gods all over the place for every situation and circumstance that might come up in life. There was a different god for each one of them. So he never heard of a single god. He never heard of a one god who could handle all of life's issues. But Abram believed God's promises when God gave them to him. And he became Abraham, the father of faith. So what was God doing? He was starting a family again. Uh -huh. And he was doing that with people who would believe in and reveal his nature through covenant. Through covenant. Not just in our behavior. Although behavior is important because people look at us and wonder what we're all about. But that's really not what God was interested in. What God was interested in is that we would reveal his covenant. Yeah. The covenant that he wanted to have with all of mankind. Amen? And so, eventually, in order to get people to trust him, instead of in themselves, God instituted the law through Moses. Mm -hmm. And the law not only revealed the character of God, but it also revealed to men and women their inability to live a life that was righteous enough to please God in their own ability, in their own strength. You're never going to please God by, by trying to be good, right. even if you're halfway good at it, right? We do that out of the relationship we already have with God, not to try to get God to, right. to like us more or right. to do something for us that he wouldn't otherwise do. See, man was incapable of living up to the commands of God. It took, I mean, if you ever read just the Ten Commandments, not to mention the other 600 and some that go yeah. along with that, we can't even keep the Ten. And it was intended that way. It was intended for us to realize, to come to the realization, you can't do this. You need God. Yes. That was the problem with Judaism. That's the problem with religion today. Trying to convince people, you can do this if you work hard enough. Yeah. 
get your act together, you can make God pleased with you. Amen? We, we're not capable of living up to those commands. But thinking that they could, men and women kept on trying and failing over and over for hundreds of years. Now look at Galatians 2, verse 16. And it couldn't be more clear. It's in, right here in front of us in English. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. He said knowing this, going into this, we already know that you can't be justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Praise the Lord. So, can you see the purpose of the commandments? Can you see the purpose of the covenant of the law? Amen? It was never intended to make humans holy. Its purpose was to reveal how badly humans need God. Yes. Amen? We have to have, it's, it's to show us, we have to have God act on our behalf. Yes. Because we're not good enough to do it on our own as humans. Amen? It was never intended to make us holy. But true to form, humanity misunderstood the ultimate purpose of the old covenant. And so they tried to use that and become like Jesus or like God through effort, through hard work, through uh, self-denial. We thought humans, speaking of humans, we could become righteous by our own effort. And it's important to realize that God was never looking for people who could keep a set of rules. He wanted relationship. He wanted love. Yes. He wanted trust. Praise the Lord. The ultimate expression of God's desire for fellowship with us came when he decided to take on human flesh himself. That reveals the love of God and how much he wanted relationship with human beings. So much so that he became a human so that he could have it, so he could establish that, and so that we could see God in the flesh, so that we could see a God, not just have an understanding of some ethereal being out there floating around in space somewhere, but a legitimate, true person that would take on flesh. God is a person. He's not just a vapor. He's not just something floating around out there. He is, he, he has a being. Yes. I mean, I don't know how else to say it. He's, he, it's, it's different than us, but yet it's the same. Yes. We were created in his image, both ways. God is a spirit. Nobody's seen him. We are spirit beings. And yet we have a body. We're just like Jesus was when he came yes. here. Yes. God in the flesh. Yes. Amen. So this is where the story gets kind of complicated. The coming of Jesus represented this whole new revelation in the covenant relationship between God and humanity. It was showing what the covenants were really all about. Amen. And so even after Jesus came, to the earth, even after God came in the flesh, most of the people insisted on clinging to the types and the shadows of the old covenant, of the past. When his purpose was came to show their inability to keep that covenant, to offer them a covenant that he would take care of. Praise the Lord. So they chose the old covenant with a partial revelation and rejected the full revelation of grace and truth that came in Jesus Christ. It's still happening today, church. Churches everywhere are do still doing the same thing. Mixing the covenants. And when you put a little leaven in, it leavens the whole lump. Praise God. Let's look at Galatians chapter 4, verse 22 through 31. This is a, you know, common scripture, and we've, I've quoted from here many times, but this is important because it's, it's, a, it's, it's the analogy that Paul uses to teach us what is actually taking place in our relationship with God, in this 
new covenant. This grace and truth that came by Jesus Christ. And so we say it's written that Abraham had two sons. The one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. He of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gendered the bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answer to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry thou that travailest not, for the, desolate, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then, he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. So Hagar, which was Sarah's handmaiden, that Abraham took as a concubine, you might say, or whatever, some, someone who he could have a child by, because Sarah was sterile. And so he... He takes this woman, and it says that Hagar is this bond, bond woman who represents the Old Covenant. Ishmael represents the fruits of the Old Covenant. Praise the Lord. So, if we go back to uh, what, where Abraham says, uh, well, Sarah, if you want me to take this other woman, I can, because we'll, we'll work this thing out somehow and make what God said come to pass. We'll do it. Yes. Right? But God didn't say you and Hagar are going to have a child. He said you and Sarah. That's right. That was the promise. Yes. But when man steps in, yes. he tries to take God's place, yes. Yes. and the next thing you know, you've got some fruit from that action, yes. and it's going to be an enemy for the rest of eternity, yes. or for the rest of natural life in terms of humanity. Yes. Amen? So, Sarah represents the new covenant, the covenant that we are a part of today. And it's only fulfilled through promise and by faith. Yes. And Isaac is the fruit of that covenant. And through Isaac comes all of the generations that would be in Christ. Right. All right, look at Galatians 4 and verse 30 again. Still there. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Okay, let's just do what the scriptures, let's just do what the Bible says, right? And here's what the Bible says. Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the freeman. So he's saying, cast out the religious activities here, and let's get on board with the promise. Let's quit trying to make things happen ourselves, and let's trust the promises of God to come to pass in our lives. Because that's the only way it's going to happen. Yes. We, can get, we can produce some stuff. But usually it'll come back to bite us. It's like the it's like the butcher working in the uh, you know working in the butcher shop and he backs up into his own meat grinder and he gets a little behind in his work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. That's kind of what ha that's what's happening with religion. Yes. We're, we're we're putting too much of us in it and it's not supposed to be in it. That's right. Praise God. Amen. So first, the old covenant operated by principles. The new covenant operates by promises. The story of Abraham and Sarah and Hagar illustrate the distinction between principles and promises. So Isaac was the product of a promise, not just a principle, but a promise. The principle being women reproduce in intimacy with man. The seed of the woman, sperm of the man, so on and so forth. The egg, the seed. Conception. A new creature begins. In this case, God waited until the principle was inoperative. Sarah could never have a child, but Abraham obviously was still able. So he waits until Abraham's no longer able either. 
so that the principle now is inoperative. It won't work. The principle may be a principle, but it's not going to work for this in this situation, right? So Isaac was the product of promise, not just the principle. God put it in a way so that they had to depend on the promise because the principle was inoperative. Now, I'm not saying it didn't happen. I'm saying it shouldn't have happened by any natural, normal thing because it, they couldn't. I guarantee you, for the 10 years or 15 years or whatever it was prior to this, they were not having intercourse. This what happened. Nothing was going to happen. But something, God did something to, in this promise, to give Abraham hope, to give him a desire, if you will, to even make the effort, and Sarah as well. But it wasn't the principle that they were operating in. It was the promise that they were operating in. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Think of the distinction between principles and promises. Look at, let's look at 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 2. Chapter 2 and verse 2. 1 Corinthians. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Yeah. Paul again. He said, I made up my mind. I don't want to know anything about you or anything about us or anything about this except that, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So I'm not going to judge you externally. I'm only going to judge you by Jesus Christ and what he has done for you. The promise. Amen? You are the righteousness of God in Christ. Amen? Now, he could have preached from anything. He could have preached from Proverbs. You know, all the the wisdom of, of the Proverbs. He could have preached that. He could have preached from the Psalms with all these expressions of, of intimacy and, and so forth with God, but he didn't. He could have preached from Genesis, the power and the creativity of God, but he didn't. He focused completely on Christ and Him crucified. Yes. Why? Because Christ's death and resurrection is the highest revelation yes. of God's design, yes. principles, and promises. God bringing life out of death. Yes. Something out of nothing. Yes. Promises require faith. You can't work a promise. It's not a formula. It can be believed or it can be refused. But you can't manipulate it. You either have to believe it or you don't. If you believe it, you'll act on it. If you don't, you'll just complain. In order to believe a promise, you have to get to know the one who makes the promise. Uh -huh. Then you have to live in patience and trust and relationship while that promise shapes your life. Uh -huh. The Old Covenant is characterized by striving, by struggling, mm -hmm. by working, by fear, by anxiety, by stress. And the New Covenant is characterized by rest. This is the rest where the weary shall find rest. What is that? The Spirit of God. The presence of God in our lives. Look at Matthew 11, 28 through 30. And we've read this many, many times as well. Jesus, the promise, is speaking. And he said, he's speaking to the religious people of his day, because that's who he taught 90% of the time, with the religious Jews. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. You're struggling to keep all these rules and regulations, and you're not very successful at it. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Become one with me. For I'm meek and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. See, striving to do something for God is a waste of labor. He wants to do something for you. Something that will be obvious so the world wonders at his goodness to you. Yes. 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 That's why this stuff that's going on right now, all of this craziness, I'm telling you, God's going to show himself mighty. Yes. He's going to show people 
How can he be so good to them? How, why, what's happened? Why is it so good for them? Why are they not freaked out? Why are they not running, uh, you know, and standing in every line for every next guess at what's going to be the answer or the cure or whatever it might be? And I'm not, I don't care, get a shot, don't get a shot. That's between you and yours. I'm just saying God has a purpose and a plan. Absolutely. And that purpose and that plan is to show himself mighty on our behalf so that others who are outside of the covenant of God will say there's something different there. Yep. Yes. Why aren't they freaked out? Why aren't they acting the way everybody? Why aren't they doing why, why, why do they seem to have peace in the midst of the storm? When God's promises are the issue, trust and rest are the result. When principles without promises are the issue, then the result is performing, striving, fear, anxiousness. It's always going to be present. It'll always be there when it's about you getting this thing done. But here's the good news. Acts 20, verse 32. And now, brethren, I commend to you, you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able, look at this, I'm, I commend you to God, to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. What, what is our part? To receive it. Yeah. So he doesn't say anything about us doing anything. He says, I'm giving you, I commend you, or I, I offer you to God. And to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified or set apart to God. The grace of God sounds too good to be true. It does sound too good to be true. Because it's coming from God, the author of good, the only yeah. real good that there is. Yes. Yeah. It looks illegal to the natural mind. Because we're basing it on old covenants and other covenants that are not existing today in terms of how God deals with us. It's beyond human reasoning. I mean, I've, 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 sat, I've laid away many nights trying to figure how in the world can this be. Yeah. It's too good. You're getting away with murder, all. Yeah. 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 It can only be embraced by the human spirit as it comes by revelation. That's why it doesn't, you don't just get up one day and have all the answers. It, every little bit of revelation yes. opens up more of the grace of God. Yes. More of the grace of God yes. offers more revelation. It just, it's an ongoing, it just never ends. I assume that's eternity. Yes. Those who aren't open to revelation can't hear it. And they take a dim view of those who do. Right? That's what God was testing with his uh, evolution theory. What, what he, what's he doing? He's testing the waters. Are you open? Or have you already shut down as far as this is concerned? I mean, that's what we're that's what we're doing. Either they're not open to revelation, or they're open for revelation. And the only way we find out is by offering them revelation. Mm -hmm. So it can become their revelation. If they don't want it, we do what Jesus did. Dust off for the next one. Yes. You sowed your seed. Yes. Hopefully, it will continue to germinate, and at some point, it can sprout again. Somebody else can come along and water it. That's what Paul said. You know, one waters, one sows, and so on and so forth. But God gives the increase. The Holy Spirit's the only one that can bring it to a fulfillment. Amen. First Corinthians chapter two, verses nine through fourteen. so good. It's almost like, you know, have you ever known somebody who said, you know, everybody's getting all excited and happy about something's going to take place, and they go, come on, calm down a little bit, because, you know, bad stuff can take place here, too. You know, there's been so, we've been blessed so much, something negative's got to happen, yeah, you, know? you know. That's kind of the way it is when we operate. We're, we're thinking, God, this is so good. There's got to be a payback. There's got to be something because everything in natural life tells you, you know, it, it's only good for so long. Eventually, something's going to happen. The warranty will run out. You know, I mean, something will happen, and you don't have to pay to fix it or whatever. But he said, no, this is so good. It's not about you. Yeah. I've been believing. A 
That's all. That's all you. That's the only part you play in this. Amen. <coughs> but as it is written, I have not seen or ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love Him. We we can't even imagine the good that God has for us. But God has revealed it unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. By revelation we get this. Amen. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Praise the Lord. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, but they're foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Again, to use that same conversation Don was having, when we talk about creating, and it's so true, when we look at it, we think, God, it take it would take a hundred times more faith to believe that all of this stuff in evolution is true. I mean, it demands so much more belief, if you will, than believing that God created the earth yeah. and all it's in it. Yeah. Praise the Lord. But see, the natural man doesn't receive the things of God. Yeah. But he'll, he'll believe a lie in a heartbeat. He'll believe the dumbest stuff the stupidest explanations and go, oh, yeah, I are not wise. <laughs> and the people of God who are truly people of God, spirit beings, they look at it and go, what in the world is wrong with them that they cannot see this simple truth right before their very eyes? Mm -hmm. It's like they have to be trying to be done. Amen? Which they, so, but this natural man receives not the things of the spirit, but they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them. Because they're spiritually discerned. Yeah, we're just these wacky Christians. Foolish. Idiots. Here's the deal. In this covenant that we're involved in, in this new covenant that we are a part of, God takes all the initiative. Amen. Under the old, the responsibility was on human beings. Bring the right sacrifice. Do the right thing afterwards. Wash your hands. Don't go here. Don't go there. Don't do anything on the side. You know, all the rules, all the right. It was up to us. It was up to man to be responsible for his own well-being, for his own uh, goodness or, or, or spirituality. Amen? They were given standards, and then they were expected to live by them. Here's the rules. Keep them. Knowing all along, they wouldn't keep them because they couldn't keep them. But they were so full of themselves and so arrogant, they said, all these things we can do. What were they thinking? They weren't thinking, or they would have kept their mouths shut and let God give them what he wanted to give them, which was mercy and grace. It was not only possible for God to do all these things, for all of these people, for all of these weak people, but then to see them fall away and completely fail. They used to call this in Pentecost backsliding. It really wasn't backsliding because that's an old covenant way of defining things. Under the new covenant, you can't backslide. Because you didn't do anything to get to the position you're in. You didn't do anything, so how you, if you don't continue doing anything, you're not going to go anywhere. You're not backsliding. You're just not growing. You're not learning. Right. But under the old covenant, you were either in, or if you backslid, or you had to turn away from God and walk away from it. But that's what they called somebody who would fail as a Christian. The truth is, if you're going to use that definition, then there's nothing but backsliders in the church. Because none of us have been able to live, live up the law or to keep the law. If we were, there would have been no reason for God to come in the first place as a human. The old covenant, it, it gives you this, it implies at least, if you're good enough and you don't sin, then God will bless you. The new covenant says, 
I will remember your sins no more. Praise God. Since you can't be good enough, I'll perform for you. And I'll credit it to your account as though you had done it. Yeah. Yeah. And God's the only one that can do it because he's the judge, yeah. the jury, the prosecuting and defense attorney. Yeah. Yes. Look at you. Let's just quick, uh, just real quick here. We'll look at uh, Genesis chapter 15, 8 through 11. And this is the story of Abram and God making a covenant with Abram. Remember, his covenants were based on promises. This is before the law. And Abraham believed God. And so he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit this? God had told him what he was going to have and what he was going to do for him. And he said, how, am I gonna, how do I know this? I mean, I, I hear this from you. I don't know if he was hearing audible voices or if it was just so strong, the Spirit of God on him, that he just knew this was something other than anything he'd ever experienced before. And he says, but how, how am I going to know this? Other than just internally. And God said, take a heifer of three years old. Now, Abram understood covenants. That's, that, that was standard practicing behavior for all peoples in that, in that day. They would, they would agree together on something. I'll take care of this situation. If you'll take care of this one for me, you're strong in this area. I'm weak in that area, but I'm strong in this area, and you're weak in that area. So we'll come together. We'll, we'll make a sacrifice, and we'll, a blood sacrifice, and a blood covenant. That I'll do what you can't do, and you'll do for me what I can't do. And that's the covenant. We have to stand by this, because if either one of us breaks it, that person dies. So yeah, this is what's happening. He said, so God tells him, take a heifer of three years old, a sheep goat of three years old, a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he took unto them all these and divided them in the midst. In other words, he split them all in half and laid each piece one against another. You know, side by side, but the birds divided me not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcass of Abraham, drove them away. All right, verse 17. <coughs> now it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, the smoking furnace. Now Abraham went to sleep. He was supposed to be, you know, keeping the sacrifices uh, presentable until God would come in and they would walk down through this thing together. That, was the re that would represent their covenant two of them. And so it came to pass that when the sun went down, it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. Abraham crashed. He's not up walking down through there. He just wakes up and sees this smoking furnace and a burning lamp coming down between all of these slain animals. The custom to establish this covenant. Each person would make their vows. They would commit to keeping him. But it doesn't happen that way with Abraham. He waits, but God doesn't come. Abraham falls asleep. Then while he's asleep, God walks through the slain animals for both of them. God's saying, I'll keep both my part and your part of that covenant. Amen. I'll swear by myself. Because yes. there's none higher. Right. Now listen to me. That was a reality for Abraham. But it also pointed to a greater reality, which was God kept that promise through Jesus Christ, who came to earth as both God and man, and ultimately fulfilled his covenant laws by making that covenant yes. with himself. Yes. 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 That's what happened. Yes. And to do anything other than that is to deny this goodness of God, the glory of God, the power of God, the, the, the mercy of God. Yeah. It's to make him something other than he is. Yeah. It's to make it about us. The pressure is not on me to fulfill any expectation, but to trust in him who took my place. That's the only expectation God has. That's the only expectation there is for any of us. And that is that we believe yes. Yes. that what he did was sufficient. Yes. Yes. Amen. Ultimately, the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant is the difference between performance consciousness and God consciousness. Yes. Yes. Amen. Performance consciousness comes from living the old covenant mentality. Have I done enough? Did I do something I shouldn't have? And we know the answer to both of those questions. And they're not good if we're just depending on us. Performance consciousness comes from living the old covenant mentality. And it focuses on what you're doing to produce. And it never gets 
this is satisfying. A law drains the very life out of you. Anybody that's lived under strict religious codes knows it's exhausting. It's draining emotionally, mentally, and even physically. It focuses on what you're producing, and it's never satisfying. Always realizing I could have done that better. I could have handled that situation better. I should have just kept quiet. I should have said something. I should have said something. You know what I'm saying? It just it haunts us. The God consciousness is the result of living under grace. And God did it all. He's the initiator and the sustainer. Psalms 131. Verses 1 through 3, it's just a three verse psalm, but Psalm 131. Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor my eyes lofty. Neither do I exercise myself in great matters or in things too high for me. Surely I have behaved and quieted myself as a child that is weaned of his mother. My soul is even weaned as a child. Let Israel hope in the Lord. You know what he's saying? He's saying, don't make it about you. You're not big enough to handle this. Your humanity cannot deal with sin. Only I can. Trust me. I'm not going to lift. I, I'm, I'm not God. All right? I'm a child of God. I make mistakes. I choose to make mistakes sometimes. Because I'm you. Because I want my way. Or because somebody self-conscious when they can be caught up in the completeness of God himself. Because the more self-conscious we are, the bigger failures we find ourselves to be. So which do we want? The one that's designed to expose our nature or the one that's designed to expose God's nature? That's what grace does. The law exposes us. It shows us to be failures. It shows us to be incapable of everything. But grace exposes God's nature. That even when I fail, I'm a winner. Winner, winner, chicken, dinner. Praise the Lord. God's on our side. He's for us. Come on. John 1, 14. John chapter 1, verse 14. You say, what about works? What about works? What about... The word was made flesh and well among us. We beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 16. And of his fullness have all we received. And grace for grace. Praise the Lord. The issue is not faith and works. The issue is faith that works. Yes. Yes. Praise yes. God. Yes. It's a change. We have to change the way we approach these things, the way we think about these things. The point, faith comes first. That's faith in what God has promised. And that's what makes it possible to enjoy the fullness of God. If you don't have faith, I mean, think of the people who have died where healing was available to them. Did they blame God? No, God made it available, but faith comes.
comes first, you've got to believe right. in what he's promised. Yes. Or it's as though it never was said. It's, it's as though it doesn't exist. This whole thing is about faith in grace. Yes. Yes. Not faith in good behavior. Not faith in my ability to be a better person. I, I don't want to imply that we should be idiots and be bad people. You know I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is we already are. We already do fail. We all do miss the mark. That's why he gave us grace. So that our sins and iniquities, he will remember no more. It's as though they don't exist. If it's not in my memory, it didn't happen. Right. It's wasted worry to be concerned about things that you can't do anything about. Yes. It's, it's wasted worry when you think about grace will make you lazy. It's, it's wasted worry to fret over taking advantage of grace. Grace doesn't work that way. Right. The new covenant is one of grace that fulfills all requirements. Yeah. Period. Yeah. I know it's too good to be true. In the natural. That's why we have to be born again. That's why we have to operate by faith. It all operates by the faith of Jesus Christ. Yes. Amen. Let me close with this. Galatians 5 and verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Cast out the bondwoman yes. yep. and trust only in Christ and in his promises. That's the answer for all of our lives, for our children, our grandchildren, and their children, and all who will come after them. And if we don't share grace with them, all we've got to offer is religion. Yeah. And all we have to offer them then is absolute failure, frustration. And many who will give up. But who we all know people like that. They came to God sincerely, believed God, trusted God, and then they got the rules. <laughs> then they found out, I can't keep all these rules. And I feel so hypocritical and so guilty going to church and pretending like I've done everything right this week and fearful, Tim, that somebody will see me yes. not doing right. Mm -hmm. And then I'll be shunned. Then I'll be an outcast. Then I'll be humiliated. God never, never taught us anything like that. No. He, it was never his intention to humiliate humanity. It was always his intention to elevate yes. humanity to a level where they could communicate and be one with God. Yes. yes. And that's what we need them to do. That's what we need to enjoy. When you start, it's like God said, when you start to get fear, Ain't God. I promise you that's not God. He's not the author of fear. He doesn't give us fear. He gives us love, peace, joy, a sound mind. Praise the Lord. All this stuff that's going on. That's how I know it ain't from God. First of all, I know God's too good to be bringing about any of it in the first place. But the anxiety and the fear that our government and, and others are trying to put on us, all of us, regardless of our positions, is to keep us in subjection to them and not to yeah, God. That's yes. right. That's true. I, I'll be damned yes. if I'll be afraid. That's right. Because I would be damned if I was afraid. Right. Am I right? I'm not yes. trying to just have an excuse to swear. I'm just saying yes. I'm not going to be damned by being afraid of something that God has already dealt with. Exactly. Yes. I'm going to trust God, exactly. and I'm going to hope that when people look at me, they won't just see my stupid stuff. They'll see here's a guy who God is blessing there's a guy who has found something because I knew him when. Yeah. And yeah, he may still have some hiccups like that every once in a while, but he's not the same guy I knew when he was right. 25 or 30 right. or 35. Right. Why? Amen. Because God has been so good to me yes. in spite of me. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll never be able to thank him enough. Amen. Amen. And all he's asking for is Yeah. Yeah. You got an issue, praise the Lord.
anyway. So God bless you all. Go in the power of his might. Trust in his grace and his goodness. And he'll show himself mighty on your behalf. In Jesus' name.